Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.6, New York in the Era of Edmund Andros. Last time, we looked at how the New Netherlands had transformed into New York. The English took the colony, then the Dutch took it back, and then following the end of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, the Dutch ceded the colony for good. We also looked at Edmund Andros, the man who was now at the helm of New York. Shaped by his childhood, which took place in the shadow of the English Civil Wars, Andros was a monarchist to his very core. This week, we are going to spend our time looking at those early years after Andros became the governor of the colony. We are going to look at some of the problems within the colony, as well as the long-term stresses that New York is going to face. So, let's get right to it. With the Dutch having formally handed over the keys of the colony to Andros, the first order of business was going to be assessing the condition of the colony. Prior to Francis Lovelace being run out of town, we had seen the Dutch in New York largely apathetic to their new English overlords. While likely not ideal, they offered no resistance to the English takeover. As we discussed, this was likely due to a couple of reasons including the fact that the Netherlands had never really had that much interest in the colony and had largely been ignored. And second, the Dutch inside the colony seemed less than anxious to fight what would ultimately be a losing war against the English. Despite the Dutch in New York not really resisting English rule, that doesn't mean the transition was always easy. Andros came into a colony that the Duke of York desperately needed to make profitable, and a population that was largely apathetic to English rule as well. While not the first colonial governor, Edmund Andros was sent to New York with a clear mission of turning the struggling colony around and making it profitable. While also dealing with an underlying stress from the grumbling of the colonists, the biggest problem for Andros was that he faced a colony that had become run down and was an economic mess. When Andros arrived in New York, the first goal was going to be securing the colony. The main fort supporting the colony sat on the tip of Manhattan and had largely deteriorated. It was obviously not lost on Andros how important it was to get the fort back in working order. There had already been three wars with the Dutch, and during the last one they had captured New York. It was not out of the question that they might want to try something again in the future. Andros likewise worked on getting the structures in the largest city, formerly New Amsterdam and now New York, into shape. Andros forced certain industries to relocate, such as tanners and slaughterhouses, while at the same time re-establishing weekly markets. These improvements were a first step in trying to make New York a better place to settle. The condition he found the colony in was one of dilapidation and filth. These preliminary steps made it more appealing and healthier, which were intended to bring new settlers and increase the overall trade from the colony. Andros faced several problems when it came to increasing trade from New York. As we have seen throughout this podcast, colonies are always an expensive endeavor and are often slow to produce any kind of return on that high investment. Following the Dutch recapture of New York during the Third Anglo-Dutch War, revenue from the colony would have dropped to zero. For the Duke of York, he was likely anxious to return the colony to something at least resembling the green. When Andros arrived in 1674, the main source of revenue came in the shape of customs duties. The population of the colony itself remained small, probably right around 10,000 total when Andros arrived. Therefore, there was going to be little in the way of tax revenue coming directly from the colonists. Of course, Andros tried to extract revenue from these familiar sources, and you had your standard litany of land taxes and taxes on livestock. These revenues, however, were most often used for local administration of the colony. Andros and his magistrates could also issue special taxes during emergency situations, which basically means that in the time of warfare, Andros could get the money he needed. The big moneymaker, however, back home is going to be those custom duties. New York was already by this point seen as a major harbor into North America, and it was these customs duties that were thought to be the real gold mine of the colony. However, while they had big plans for the port, As of 1674, it was still not generating enough income to make New York resemble anything even remotely profitable. The Duke of York had established his trade rates at 2% on all incoming goods from England and then 10% on all foreign goods. New York had, under the Dutch, been a colony that was entrenched in the growing fur trade, 
However, the English had reasons to want to move away from the fur trade and diversify the economy. Among these reasons included that the French were increasingly dominant in the trade and relying on a foreign power to supply the product was a risky venture in the best of times. Indeed, Andros set out on a mission to establish several crops. These included wheat, beef, pork, tobacco, lumber, as well as pitch and tar. Andros did not want New York to develop a single cash crop system like we see down in Virginia with tobacco. While profitable, the fact that tobacco was the only major export for Virginia is going to help keep the colony in a constantly precarious situation. It means that if something were to ever happen to the price of tobacco in any way, it can come with devastating results to the economy. This alone provided Andros with the reasoning for wanting to diversify the economy of New York. The problem for Andros, however, is that despite his best attempts to increase trade and further diversify the economy of New York, he was largely being sabotaged internally. Well, not something set out to spite him specifically. Trade policies of England had become increasingly troublesome in the colonies. The chief issue for New York came in the way of the Navigation Acts. We are going to be spending a lot of time talking about the Navigation Acts here in the near future. Next episode, when we begin looking at Bacon's Rebellion, we are going to spend time looking at what the navigation laws were, as they are going to directly contribute to what made Virginia so ripe for a rebellion. However, the Navigation Acts would prove to be a hindrance to trade in more than just Virginia. The Navigation Acts were a series of laws passed by England that sought to better control and monetize the trade between the colonists and literally everybody else. When I say everybody else, this includes trade between the colonies. So, for example, New England and Virginia would have had trade directly between them clipped as England sought to increase internal revenues. It should not come as a surprise to anybody that basically everybody in the colonies despised these regulations and blamed them for hurting trade. Specifically in New York, the chief complaint was that the trade of certain items were required to flow through England. This means that trade between New York and foreign powers with these items was completely prohibited. Instead, the colonists would have to send the goods back to England, and from there England would handle the international trade. For the largely Dutch colony, this really bristled them. Just to ensure that this was being properly enforced, only English ships could also now land in English colonial ports. Likewise, not helping anything had been the Anglo-Dutch wars. Previously, the Dutch had been the premier trading partner with the English. However, following years of warfare, this relationship had degraded. At least initially in England, there had been some level of flexibility here. The Privy Council allowed three Dutch ships per year to travel into New York. However, following 1675, Charles II decided to take a more aggressive approach towards colonial trade and quickly enforced the Navigation Acts and made them far less flexible. For Edmund Andrus, this means that shortly after his arrival, that limited amount of trade with the Dutch is just shut down, which sends the already tenuous colonial economy into an increasingly worse place. Andrus had, for his part, requested from the Duke of York that New York be allowed to ignore these acts. However, the Duke refused. Ultimately, his brother was the king and James was not about to challenge royal prerogative, especially on a matter such as colonial trade. Andros, well clearly a Stuart man and absolutely a law and order guy, would still occasionally turn a blind eye to the occasional Dutch ships which slipped into the harbor. Andros choosing to ignore certain parts of the Navigation Acts did go a long way towards improving the local economy. Now, it is important to realize that Andros did not do this across the board. However, with wealthy traders turning a blind eye towards the illegal shipments, it did a lot to both stabilize the economy and increase revenue into the colony. By keeping this practice limited to a small number of Dutch merchants, Andros limited the potential consequences of being discovered. Furthermore, for those who were not on his preferred list, they still enjoyed the full sets of restrictions as everybody else. Andros, despite the early successes in improving the economy, would ultimately begin getting pushback from England. In 1677, the king cracked down on intercolonial trade. While it had been on the books for years, Andros was now faced with the reality that trade between New York and the other colonies was going to be prohibited. Despite protests by Andros, the government back in London shut his complaints down. 
Following 1677, therefore, exports from New York quickly dried up as enforcement increased. With the Navigation Acts slowing everything down, Andros turned his attention to increasing the population of the colony. Turning to the old trick of offering a generous head ride of 60 acres for all freemen, plus another 50 acres for a wife and each kid, Andros made his bid to grow the colony. Next, Andros banned the distilling of wheat in the colony. This had two effects. First, it immediately increased the amount of grain that was available for export. If they can't distill it, the next best option was to sell it. In a twofold effect, the decision by Andros also helped raise import duties as well. It's not like the colonists in New York wanted to live a life of complete sobriety. Andros wasn't some crusader for prohibition. With local distilleries being limited, New Yorkers turned to the West Indies. Imported rum became the drink of choice in the colony, which meant additional import duties as the rum had to pass through the harbor. Despite the limitations under the Navigation Acts, the New York economy did grow during Andros' time as governor. While increased profits were awesome if you were the Duke of York, the problem remained that the profits weren't evenly spread throughout the colony. This would lead to feelings of discontent throughout New York. Amongst those suffering the most tended to be the middle-class merchants who had seen their ability to trade slashed. For the colony to survive and prosper, Andros was going to need something more than apathetic acceptance. New York was, to a degree, a difficult place to govern because it was largely a melting pot of religions and cultures. Beyond this simmering dismissiveness, however, there remained an underlying anger over the lack of any true representation for New Yorkers. This remained especially problematic for Andros when it came to the settlers in Long Island. Recall from last week that Long Island had long been part of Connecticut. The colony had grown around the idea of representative government, and now that it was gone, the inhabitants were seriously upset. With so much of the political history being to this point an attempt to avoid potentially arbitrary government, New York marked the worst of those excesses. Everything about New York was arbitrary. This had been a problem in Long Island since the English first captured New York from the Dutch. The problem for New Yorkers is that there was no real interest in changing the status quo. Charles II and James, Duke of York, weren't exactly big fans of assemblies. Let us not forget that their father had been beheaded by Parliament and they had spent over a decade in exile. The position of the English governors inside New York was basically to tell the colonists to stop complaining and deal with it. Lovelace and Nichols had both dealt with the blowback during their time. And now that Edmund Andros had taken the reins of government, the problem fell into his lap. Andros, for his part, wasn't completely against the idea of having some kind of a local governing structure in the colony. He saw the usefulness of having an assembly and realized that, to some degree at least, local autonomy did serve a purpose. However, despite that, the fact remains that Andros was, to his very core, a loyal agent of the Stuarts. Despite him not having a problem with an assembly personally, at least for right now, he was not about to do anything that would fly in opposition to the Duke of York. Therefore, it is going to remain the Duke who is the first and final voice of what the laws would be inside of the colony. Beyond the obvious desire of the colonists to have some kind of autonomy over their own futures, other colonies had learned that some kind of representative assembly was necessary largely out of pragmatic reasons. The Duke of York could make all the laws he wanted. However, there is something to be said for the ability to react to situations on the ground. In Virginia, back in 1619, when we see the House of Burgesses form, it is not out of some egalitarian desire for freedom. It is because the settlers in Virginia wanted at least a minimum amount of say regarding their own affairs. If you recall from those episodes, even Charles I a guy who super hated assemblies ultimately acquiesced and allowed the House of Burgesses to meet from time to time because practicality required it. Furthermore, despite Andrus having 100 troops, he was still completely outnumbered by the settlers. An assembly would have been a useful tool in running the day-to-day -day operations of the colony and making the colonists feel more invested. Andrus did have the ability to have a council of ten around him. However, at least initially, Andros did not see use for all ten men. Further, 
while Andros had the power to pass laws for the colony, they were only in power for a single year, pending the Duke of York's approval. The decision to maintain a kind of absolutism in New York was never a popular thing amongst the colonists. The Dutch complained that they had previously been reassured that their rights would be upheld. However, they found themselves shut out of government completely. Likewise, Andros had to deal with continuing complaints out on Long Island, who desperately wanted to defect back to the government of Connecticut. Tensions finally did reach a head in 1680. During that year, Andros had been recalled to London to answer for potential mishandlings of colonial revenue. Now, this itself is not an important fact, at least just yet. Andros was never found to have acted wrong in any way here. Instead, the trial was part of a bigger political event known as the Exclusion Crisis, which saw a lot of fingers being pointed at the Duke of York and questioning what his role was in the line of royal succession. Now, you do not need to worry too much about the Exclusion Crisis for today. I am going to, however, come back to this later in the season where we are going to talk about it in much, much more depth because it will be important. But for now, know that Andrus will ultimately be acquitted of the charges against him. The bigger deal here is that Edmund Andros, who was such a dominant force in New York by 1680, was now out of the colony entirely. In his place, he left Anthony Brockholes in charge. The problem came when customs duties expired. You see, the practice had been that custom duties were set for three-year periods, the previous one having been set in November of 1677. When November of 1680 rolled around, three years later, the duties were set to expire. The problem, however, is that nobody ever set new duties. Andros was back in London and had an instituted new duties before he left. The job of collecting the duties belonged to William Dyer. When Dyer went in November of 1680 to collect the duties, the merchant said, Custom duties? What custom duties? Those old things? Well, those are expired now. So, yeah, we're not going to be paying those. Suddenly, New York Harbor was wide open and nobody was paying any customs duties. These duties were critical as they were largely the revenue that allowed the government of New York to function. So, now you've got a government that is going to run out of money very quickly and the main guy leading the government isn't home at the moment. Dyer, for his trouble, became the face of this entire fiasco. He attempted to use soldiers to try and strong-arm the payments, a move that did nothing other than infuriate the colonists. Now, facing charges that he was violating the Magna Carta and was trying to bring tyranny to New York, Dyer was brought up on charges in the courts. The judges, realizing that they were going down a dangerous path and not wanting to bring the ire of the Duke of York, decided not to pursue the case. Dyer was instead loaded onto a boat and sent back to London to answer for his crimes. Dyer had suddenly become the face of arbitrary government in New York. Now suddenly, it was not only those out on Long Island angry over the lack of representation, but rather the entire colony. The grand jury had come back with an indictment for Dyer, and the colonists had desperately wanted the Court of Assizes, the main judicial court in New York, to move forward with the charges. The court included colonists and was the nearest thing they had to a representative body in the colony. With the government of the colony nearly out of money, Brockholes wrote to Andros and let him know that things were quickly going south and the colony was in real trouble. Adding to the growing headache that the Duke of York had at this point, James had recently learned that he was not entitled to any of the custom duties from New Jersey. If you recall from last time, in an effort to raise funds, James had sold a large portion of New York in order to drum up some revenue. Even after the sale, however, James continued to collect customs duties. When James was informed that he had no right to be doing that, he suddenly faced further financial calamity. The colony just lost approximately a third of its income at the same time that the colonists on the ground in New York had decided to stop paying as well. All of this was continuing under the backdrop of colonists complaining that they had absolutely no sense of redress for their grievances as the Duke of York continued to refuse an assembly. Needing to get the colony to calm down and, most importantly, begin producing revenue again, the Duke of York decided that there was really only one course of action. It was time to cave into demands and create a legislative assembly. 
By this point, a lot in the colony had changed. It was now 1783. Edmund Andros, despite being acquitted of the charges against him, was done as the governor of New York. In his place, Thomas Donegan would be the governor to head back and bring with him the authority to create a legislative body. If you're feeling sad about Edmund Andros leaving our story, do not fret. He is going to be back, and he is going to be back often when we get just a little bit further down the road. I promise you all that when we are done with him, you will all be so incredibly sick of the name Edmund Andros. We are going to conclude our introduction to the New York colony by taking the time to explore the new government structure in New York. The Duke of York was desperate to make New York profitable again. After years worth of problems extracting custom duties, James was finally willing to grant the colony an assembly if it meant that they would start producing tax revenue again. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the decision was made to keep Andros back in London rather than having him return to New York. The most likely reason for this decision is that Andros was seen as the face of arbitrary rule in New York. He was a deeply unpopular figure amongst many of the colonists for his heavy-handed rule. And while true that many had become wealthy during his time in the colony, many more had seen their livelihoods destroyed. Andros, in his effort to clean up Manhattan, had required that businesses such as tanners and slaughterhouses move out of the city. These moves were costly and in many cases were difficult to overcome. On top of that, Andros had not dealt with the people equally. As we discussed, Andros was willing to bend the rules when he felt there was a tangible benefit to himself and the greater colony. If you were on the outside looking in, however, Andros wasn't going to be your favorite guy. However, in 1683, the Andros era was over and the Donegan era was just beginning. Thomas Donegan brought with him the authority from the Duke of York to open up an assembly for the creation of laws in the colony. Now, the Duke of York had basically zero interest in making New York a bastion of democratic reform. In fact, the marching orders to Donegan was to let the colony have its assembly only until sufficient revenues had been raised to basically render the power of the assembly moot. In other words, once cash flow picked back up, Donegan was to avoid the assembly altogether. New York's first assembly met in October of 1683. Unsurprisingly, the Long Island colonists, the ones who had been clamoring for representation for the last decade, were the ones who immediately took control over the proceedings. The assembly was designed to meet at least once every three years and include a vote for all freemen in the colony. The colonists, along with the governor and his personal council, had a say in the taxes being imposed and collected. What emerged from all this was a document that would become known as the New York Charter of Liberties. The mission statement of the Charter of Liberties was to For the better establishment of government of the province of New York and that justice and right may be equally done to all persons within the same. The document begins by laying out some of the basic framework of government. It lays out that the governor and his council would rule in conjunction with the assembly. The charter also laid out the basics such as how often the assembly would meet, who could vote, and how representatives were chosen. However, the real legacy of the Charter of Liberties is the establishment of protections for individual liberties of the colonists. The Charter sought to do everything it could to legislate the governor into his own place and the assembly into its. In other words, the drafters wanted to ensure that the governor couldn't encroach on matters that belonged to the assembly. Regarding these specific individual rights passed, we see several things that were largely seen in the other New England colonies. Things such as due process of law and the right to trial by jury were protected by the new charter. Likewise, there was an attempt to make sure that the punishments were appropriate and equally given throughout society. This also included a curtailing of the ability to declare martial law. The new charter was designed to protect the liberties and the colonists had no interest in allowing tyrannical governments the power to bypass this with a declaration of martial law. Inheritance laws, which had largely been influenced by the era of Dutch rule, shifted in a direction more in line with what was common in England. This largely stopped the unpopular practice of seizing land for little reason. Interestingly, this also included a rather liberal provision for women. If a woman's husband should die and she wished to retain the land, this was now something that she had the power to request. Overall, the rights of the landowners were greatly increased through the Charter of Liberties. 
These changes may well have been influenced by the years under Andros where he often played it fast and loose with land restrictions and ownership. Religious freedom was granted as part of the Charter of Liberties if that religion was Christianity. However, this does mean that Puritans, Quakers, and Catholics would have the right to practice their faith alongside members of the Anglican Church. The large degree of religious freedom likely does tie itself directly to the Dutch influence on the colony. The Dutch had a long history of being tolerant of religion, and this was something that had become a defining aspect of the New York colony. The new laws also prohibited quartering of troops except in times of war. This is the first time that such a provision appears in the colonial charters and is something that will ultimately find its way into the United States Bill of Rights some 100 years later. This does also, however, go back to the importance of land ownership in the colony. New Yorkers wanted to be clear that land ownership was not a matter to be taken lightly and rather was something that should be both respected and held sacred. The new Charter of Liberties was, in form, like the New England constitutions we have seen passed already. This was especially noticeable as the document really did strive to curtail and prevent the expansion of arbitrary government. Andros was seen in the eyes of many as being the face of arbitrary government in the colonies. He was bound by virtually nothing which led to a system that was riddled with inequalities. Unfair and unequal rule of law had become the thing that had made Andros so deeply unpopular by the end of his time. Avoiding arbitrary government was something that was a major consideration in all the colonies, however it does always seem to be especially poignant in New England. That the Charter of Liberties was similar to the other charters and grants of liberty that had been made during this time, especially in New England, shouldn't come as a huge surprise. It was, after all, Long Island, that group that had been so desperate for a representative assembly that was now leading the New York Assembly. They had once been part of the Connecticut colony. Back in episode 1.28, when we had discussed the fundamental orders of Connecticut, which had stood out for how liberal it was, well, it is now people who had lived under that who were writing the charter for New York. So the parallels between the two documents do make sense. The liberal nature of the Charter of Liberties also spoke volumes to how New Yorkers viewed themselves in the greater English sphere. The assembly was set up in such a way that it was set up to operate as something of a light version of Parliament. Which, of course, it should because, after all, New York was not some captured or occupied land. Rather, it was made up of English subjects who had voluntarily uprooted and traveled to the colonies. They should, in their own mind at least, therefore, have the same rights and privileges as the English back at home had. The place of the colonies in the English Empire, however, is something that is not going to be decided in New York in 1683. It is going to instead be at the center of a debate that is going to rage throughout the colonies for the next decade as the Glorious Revolution sweeps up England. And beyond that, it is these questions that are going to be at the forefront of the debates in the 1760s and 70s. The question of the colony's role in the empire will, in fact, never be answered in large part, as the ultimate solution to that question is going to be independence. This is a theme that we are going to be coming back to a lot this season and going on into next season. Ultimately, however, for the time being, the colonists were happy because they had finally gotten the representation that they had been demanding for a decade. They had a say in their own affairs and the right to pass their own laws. This would quell a huge amount of the internal strife, at least for right now. With their main demand now being met, the colonists quickly started paying custom duties again. These duties were critical to making sure that the government functioned, a government that the colonists now had a direct stake in. Thomas Donegan was happy because he was popular amongst the colonists. He had brought them representation and handed them a share of their colony. However, more important to Donegan was the fact that the Duke of York was happy. The colony was finally producing revenue again after years of economic distress and fighting over the existence of custom duties. With New York now being on a far more stable and ultimately profitable footing, the colony began to grow. By 1685, the colony's population exceeded 15,000. That is up by 5,000 inhabitants over the number that we saw when Edmund Andros first came to the colony. More people meant more tax revenue, which meant an even more stable economy. Among the places that was growing the quickest in New York were the cities. 
New York City now had a population of 3,000 people. Albany had a population of 1,500, with Long Island being the biggest single settlement with a population of over 6,000 people. Well, things certainly do appear to be better, problems did remain in the colony. Following this episode, we are going to jump off into a period of American colonial history where war, uprising, and rebellions would dominate the storyline for nearly 20 years. This isn't going to be some contained event either. From the Chesapeake up through New England, colonial revolt is going to be the order of the day for the next two decades. New York isn't going to be spared from these events either. When we return to New York later this season, we are going to be meeting the colonist Jacob Leisler, who is going to lead an uprising in New York that would last from 1689 until 1691. However, that is for the future. Until then, we are going to leave New York to enjoy a few short years of peace and quiet. Next time, we are going to begin looking at the rebellions that are going to come to so dominate the later portion of the 17th century of colonial America. To begin the story, we are going to be traveling south to Virginia, where Governor William Berkeley is about to clash with colonist Nathaniel Bacon. So until next time, I hope all of you out there are staying healthy and staying safe. We will be back here in two weeks' time to begin our journey into Bacon's Rebellion. Rebellion.